opening statement. This is Northampton Conservation Commission meeting for the 23rd of January 2020. The commission is a group of unpaid volunteers who work to protect the natural environment of Northampton. We are concerned with the aid interests defined in the Massachusetts Wetlands Act, and the duties also include open space acquisition and management. We operate in a way that's consistent with open meeting law requirements. All meeting dates, times, and agendas are posted in advance, and we invite public comment during our meetings, or whether we ask the public to make their comments the issues that are in our purview. Today's agenda includes a continuation of a notice of intent uh, for a three-story apartment building at Dewey Court, um, where the applicant has requested a continuation, uh, and a notice of intent for bridge replacement on I-91 uh, over US Route 5 and the railroad and the white uh, 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 the uh, uh, I guess we have no minutes or first are there any general public comments separate from the particular case? If not, uh, Sarah, are we recording? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so notice the intent for bridge replacement uh, uh, I ninety one over US Route five would be um, Railroad widening the continuation. Oh, we got to do that in the first place. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, notice of intent under the wetlands ordinance for construction of a new three story apartment building and related site utility work within wetland resource areas and buffer zones. This is on Dewey Court. Uh, the applicant has requested continuation until March 12th. Uh, first time of that day, it's not So, we're going to make a motion to continue. So moved. And a second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So good. Now, uh, notice of intent for bridge replacement. Uh, the uh, last DOT is the applicant. Thank you. Uh, my name is Steve Cronkite. I'm uh, with uh, Parson. We're the consultant to uh, NASDAQ. Also in the room uh, is Paul King uh, on the end of the NASDAQ project manager. Uh, Rob Natario. Uh, NASDAQ District to uh, Environmental. Uh, Harris Ewell, uh, the project manager for Parsons. Um, so I'll, I'll follow through. I have an agenda. If anyone's interested, and in, I can uh, pass this out. It just basically shows the order that we're going to go in. Oh, sure. and, yeah. uh, and I do have four copies of the slides that I can pass out as well. So maybe I'll start that. And, uh, Okay, great. Five copies of the slides. You know that one? Maybe I'll share it. Okay, great. Thank you, Brian. Thanks. Thank you. I'll take one. Kind of toggle back and forth between the printed and the, uh, the screen. But, um, submitted an NOI for wetland impacts and boarding land subject to flooding impacts for this project. Uh, as I mentioned, we're the consultant to MassDOT. Uh, the project is overseen by FHWA. Um, just as a, as a high level uh, mm -hmm. overview, uh, basically this is exit 18, uh, I, north is this way, I-91 over Route 5, and, uh, which is Mount Tom Road, and also the railroad, and also the smaller bridges uh, over Hockenham Road. Two bridges here, one for northbound and one for southbound. Two bridges here, one for northbound and one for southbound. And um, also included in the project is some improvements to Route 5, US 5. Here's the limits of the Route 5 work, basically from the levee uh, down to Atwater, or Atwood, excuse me. And here's the locations of the bridges. So originally it was a bridge project with some uh, minor improvements to Route 5. Uh, then we took a more of a look at it and really felt that the Route 5 needed some other amenities like um, uh, sidewalks, bike, way, bike lanes, uh, turning uh, lanes. So the Route 5 work um, grew to a larger than initially anticipated. Uh, I'll 
turn it. Uh, I'll turn it over now to Harris, and maybe you can just run through some of the, uh, the basically what we're doing, and then I'll get then I'll come back and talk about the impacts and the mitigation. And good evening. Um, so basically, um, we have a couple of issues on the bridges and also on the roof five. So on bridges, these are structurally deficient bridges. If you drive by, you'll see they are on band-aid. It needs uh, replacement. And on the route five, it is a congestion. If you drive in the morning or peak hour, you'll see congestion on route five also in the in intersection, I did, interchange 18. So, and also there is no pedestrian and bicycle accommodation, so you need to put some air foundation on the bicycle. And lane configuration is not currently up to date, so we are trying to make it better in this project. So, so you can see the bridges, the column circles crumbling down, the structure is very bad condition. And if you look very carefully, you'll see some of them are on the timber net. It means it's probably at the end of the service life. Um, we are currently working on it. It's Just worked that way for a decade. <laughs> so now it is <coughs> the time to replace it. Yeah. We are working on it there. Um, so this is on the Hokanam Road. The bridges, this is single span bridges, small bridges, two of them. Um, this is, uh, it's only some uh, agricultural farm vehicles drive there, but it still it needs some improvement, it needs some replacement on the bridge and also on the roadway. Uh, so project goals, our goal is to replace these bridges uh, in accordance with NAS duty current standard. Uh, relief conditions by adding turning lanes. Uh, we are trying to add turning lanes. It is on the southbound on the Route 5. So when you go up to southbound of I-91 or northbound of I-91 from southbound, we are going to add that uh, turning lane. That's the addition of it. And improve intersection safety by adding pedestrian. We are adding signal on the pedestrian for pedestrians at the intersection and ramp locations. Improve bicycle and pedestrian accommodations. Northampton is now a model city we have to accommodate bicycles, pedestrians. This is all we are trying in every city, but Northampton is currently considered as a model city, so we are trying to accommodate that. Uh, improve lane configuration, we are doing that in this project. That is our goal for this project. Uh, basically, in brief, the project scope is we are widening the bridges on Northampton over the Route 51. We are adding six feet or so so that we can widen the auxiliary lane and the shoulder. That's the purpose. And on the Hakana, we are adding only four feet extra to make the wider shoulder for the Hakana Road bridges. And we are on the on the Route 5. We are adding sidewalk on the west side. Uh, the southbound side, we are adding sidewalk and bike lane on both sides. So that is the thing. And we are adding, making the signal better. Uh, provide dedicated bike, bike lane improve. Now, right now, there is some utility congestion in this area. So we are making sure that we are creating a couple of conduits to put the utility in one location so that it doesn't spread over the whole place. Just making it within the nice area so that we can really to work and go smoothly in the future. Uh, so the current schedule, uh, we submitted the 75% submission uh, in, back in December. Uh, today is our committee meeting. And we are submitting the 100% submittal uh, May 2020. Uh, and construction is hoping to be begin around fall 2020. And generally, it will take probably, our estimate is three years of construction. So during that construction, there will be some temporary impact because uh, we don't want to reduce the traffic. We don't want to make traffic congested on the I-91. So we're creating a temporary bridge in the median lane. So basically, we'll be sequencing the I-91 in such a way that when we're working on the southbound, 
traffic will be shifted to the median bridge and then, and then when you're working on the southbound, traffic will be shifted to the median lane. So we're sequencing that way. That's why we're using the temporary bridge. Otherwise, it will be huge impact on the traffic on the I-91. And in that way, we are also making the ramp go around the ramp. We have to down. Temporarily, we have some readjustment on the ramp area, but then after the construction is done, it will be in the permanent location. There is some temporary impact on this project. Um, so the environmental permitting currently, uh, NEPA uh, is complete. Uh, ENF is submitted. We submitted this middle of January. And uh, Steve will describe the st current st standing of <coughs> the permit. So we can Thank go you. through that. Thanks, Aaron. So this slide just kind of shows where we're at in terms of the other permits besides the NOI. Uh, NEPA category solutions complete. The MEPA ENF uh, will be submitted uh, probably next week um, or the week after. Um, and that's due to temporary, uh, we had uh, impacts over the threshold for both other wetlands, within, which would be BLSF. That's what triggered that for the, uh, the need for an ENF. Section 106, uh, they found uh, there were no issues with that. Uh, the, uh, the NOI is what we're here today for. The Section 401 Water Quality Certificate, uh, we, that's being submitted either today or tomorrow uh, by MassDOT. So that's kind of concurrent with this. Uh, 404 will be submitted uh, early February. Rare species review has already been done. Uh, 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 Excuse uh, me, what, what's 404? 404 is uh, the core permit for wetland impacts at the federal level. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the rare species uh, work is, uh, oops, has already been done, and the uh, um, uh, uh, a survey has been done and found that there was no, there is a uh, polygon on the project in the project area. This wetland, these wetlands here are mapped as uh, uh, you know potential habitat. So, uh, and the GSP came out and took a look at that with the DMT and found that there was no uh, it was a uh, green dragon kind of a plant that was suspected to be there, but it turned out not to be there. So. Um, and we're not impacting that wetland anyways. Uh, NPDES permit will be uh, developed by the contractor and adhered to. Um, and then the Section 448 review is for the any work near or on the levy. So it's something we kind of come right up to the levy at the north end of Route 5. And so we coordinated with um, the Army Corps. Uh, yeah, up here. Uh, make sure that they didn't have any objections to it. So we're all set. Um, but, you know, you may wonder why this is not being treated as a footprint bridge project because we're replacing these bridges on alignment. Initially, initially we considered maybe splitting it so the Route 5 work would be uh, uh, not exempt, but the bridge work itself would be exempt. It just became kind of too uh, too complicated, and we didn't see any advantage to really splitting the project into two pieces. So we're processing it all. Uh, through the NOI process, and uh, so there'll be an NOI and also a water quality certificate for all the work as a whole, rather than trying to take advantage of the footprint bridge project, because the Route 5 work is really more extensive than is actually technically required for the bridges, so we thought it'd be kind of uh, pushing it <laughs> to try to get the whole project under the bridge exemption, so we didn't take that route. Uh, the wetland impacts are and well, I'll, I'll kind of have a blow up of the, the impact areas, but um, this slide here, and it's probably small from where you're sitting, but this shows the project area, and the north is to the right. Uh, here's Route 5. These, the green shapes are all of the wetlands that were delineated uh, in the project area. The, um, the one this red box points to the one permanent um, well in impact. And, uh, so that's 174 square feet of permanent impact and that's to, that's because of the Route 5 widening. As we, 
and the turning lane and the, the bike lanes and the sidewalk um, that pushes the west side of Route 5 out into this existing uh, wetland. So the red portion is the permanent impacts, the yellow is temporary impacts between the toe slope and the, um, the set controls, uh, and then the green is the unaffected portion. So we'll, we'll look at that. Um, we initially we had larger impacts. We had used a sort of a standard two to one slope, and we pulled it back to a one to one using a mechanically stabilized earth slope. It's just got some tiebacks in there to allow a steeper slope to reduce the impacts. It helped us not only with wetland impacts but also with floodplain uh, impacts and floodplain storage, which, uh, which we really needed to minimize. So that's wetland two B. Uh, so the, the red portion is 174 square feet, the yellow portion is 651 square feet. Wetland 1 is the other uh, wetland that's impacted. For wetland 1, this is directly under the bridges, um, uh, northbound and southbound bridge, and there's going to be a temporary bridge in the middle between there. So you can see that, you know, to create a working area to do all that, um, we knew that we would be impacting that wetland temporarily. So we're gonna put timber matting over it to allow us to stage equipment on top of it. Um, then we'll restore the wetland after, afterwards. So that's our big, you know, in terms of square feet, that's our big impact, they over 8,000 square feet for wetland one. But again, that's temporary, there's no permanent impacts. The pier columns for the new bridges will be the same number and same diameter as the existing pier columns. So there's no net uh, impacts to So we have a total of 134 square feet permanent and uh, 8,600 temporary. And the wetland 2B, um, we say boring vegetated wetland, it's really, it could be called an isolated uh, vegetated wetland, but we're just treating it the same because we, we, uh, we didn't want to try to make the case for it being isolated to the core and all that. So we're just treating it the same and, uh, and with the understanding that we'll need to mitigate for it. So we are providing mitigation. <clears throat> That's just a zoom in of uh, one of the slides showing the wetland 2B X. <coughs> and again, that's uh, on the west side of Route 5, uh, just before the northbound on ramp. And it's caused by the expansion of the Route 5 embankment for the bike lane, sidewalk, etc. Uh, this is a picture of that existing wetland. Uh, it's basically a part of the mowed infield area. In here, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a, when during the winter or spring, there's rutting because of the mowing. It's, you know, you can see it's wet, but it appears to be kind of a perched wetland uh, because <coughs> there's a lower area behind the pine trees that's not a wetland. So uh, it seems like there's water coming off the road, uh, kind of collecting there, maybe some groundwater also, but in any event, it's a uh, mowed lawn that, you know, had hydric, hydric soil, hydric vegetation, uh, wetland vegetation, hydrology, so that's why we flagged it as a wetland. Um, this is just a zoom in of wetland one directly underneath the bridges, and there's a photo of it. It's an herbaceous uh, uh, wetland, um, emergent wetland with herbaceous plants, uh, quite a few invasives. This is looking north towards, you can see the salt sheds and the uh, DOT depot area. This is kind of standing under the northbound bridge, looking under the southbound bridge. Some vervain, but there is um, blue straw <coughs> there also. So part of the work that we would be doing would be to manage the invasives and then we restore that, those temporary contacts. We're working with uh, Tara Mitchell in, in, uh, in the Farmers and Landscaping Office, and she's uh, been able to advise on seed mixes and uh, basis management. So she's been involved in the project, and she's seen the site and understands the issues. Um, so for the 174 square feet of permanent impacts at uh, that wetland to the the Mon wetland. We're proposing to augment wetland one, which is the one that's under the bridge. 
initially we had uh, sketched out a, a separate wetland over in an infield area, but um, after a couple of field trips, it became clear that it really made more sense to try to tack on to an existing wetland. This is this area sort of undulates a little bit, so this is upland right now, but it's very easy to accommodate a little excavation and um, bring it down to a level where it'll be the same elevation as this wetland and bring in the wetland soils. Um, and Sarah, I do have uh, the specification for this wetland creation okay. area, so I'll leave that to you. With you. Uh, the green coating here is, uh, the cross hatching is, means uh, wetland creation area. Uh, the yellow means that we're going to be restoring, you know, it's a temporary impact for wetland and one will be restoring that uh, by scarifying and, uh, seed, uh, and seeding as well. So 215 square feet of compensation versus 174 square feet of impact. So it's uh, slightly over one to one. Bordering land subject to flooding, uh, really it's, it's the same uh, issue that uh, is causing the, this wetland impact is this entire area is there's a, a slide in the computer somewhere, but this might be quicker just to show, but I'm sure you're aware that, you know, the entire area outside the levee other than the, the highway, which is shown raised in white here, is all floodplain. Mm -hmm. So um, we really had to look hard to find a place to create floodplain compensation for the um, storage volume, and especially at the one, one to one, uh, one foot to one foot increment. Uh, here uh, we see that the totals, so here we have um, the project is gonna displace 1,600 cubic yards of flood storage below the 100-year flood elevation. And we're creating 17, almost 1,800 compensation. So overall, there'll be a net increase, but we are struggling to find any uh, adequate um, flood storage at these higher elevations. So you can see there's some negatives here where we're filling in from the Route 5 and Banklin expansion <coughs> um, at, the, at, the, at these elevations, 122 to 120, 121 to 122, for example. We're filling in 445 cubic yards. We're creating 215, so there, that leaves a deficit uh, that we mm -hmm. uh, is balanced out down here. But that's you know that's something we're struggling with. So because the overall net is um, compensating, you know, we ideally, from our point of view, we'd like to have that be accepted as the uh, um, compensation for the floodplain storage um, and. This is the floodplains volumes, uh, floodplain storage volume area. It's between the, the bridges and the DOT salt sheds. Um, we're going to be scooping down um, to create more volume. You know, getting rid of some of the <coughs> existing soil that's there, making it steeper over here, so that we have a created now floodplain storage volume. Uh, the Patterning, which is barely visible here, that just means the seed mix. But the entire uh, area is going. This is a parking lot. This triangular area. So we're going to just lower that a tiny bit uh, to try to get some of that higher elevation without making the parking lot not usable. Uh, but most of the excavation is going to be out in the uh, the area that's not paved, and while preserving access down to the bridges, because this is a key access down between the saw sheds to underbridge areas for future maintenance. Uh, and that's, that, that's all I had on the board, although I did want to mention a couple of stormwater features. Because we're going to be, right now there's really not any stormwater uh, detention basins or stormwater BMPs out there. We're going to be using deep sumps, which is kind of the, the norm now, of course. Uh, but in addition, we're going to be building two bioretention ponds uh, to, uh, to achieve the water quality objectives. One is on Route 5. It's a small, a 
smaller one. That'll take the runoff from basically the west side of, of Route 5. On the east side of Route 5, we're going to use country drainage, so no curb on the, on the east side of Route 5. Over here, there's curb in portions of it now, but we're getting rid of the curb and uh, you know, feeling the overland flow would be better uh, water quality wise. And um, we don't need the curb on that side because that side does not have a sidewalk. It will not have a sidewalk. Uh, so the west side will have a sidewalk, so we do need a curb for safety. Um, this is the stormwater basin. Uh, it's a little, this is just, just uh, north of this wetland. So you can see between, between the bridges and the northbound on ramps. So this will take this uh, drainage from the east side of Route 5, go into a sediment four bay, and then uh, it'll outlet into the existing um, uh, wetland, which now drains underneath the railroad and Route 5 uh, towards the Connecticut River. And the other stormwater feature is a larger feature, and that's going to be uh, also in the same same infield area, but it's much larger, and it's going to collect water from uh, existing runoff, basically, uh, and, and slightly wider uh, paved area in the, from our project. So it's going to collect that water, and there's no sediment four bays designed, but because there's all these individual uh, outlets, and so basically it's a much broader, flatter shape, and it'll collect there and then outlet, it outlets overland through uh, mowed lawn and then eventually into wetlands. And uh, they'll, be, they'll have, uh, both of the water, the bioretention ponds will have, you know, appropriate native seeding and, uh, and some plantings as well for landscaping. all I had, you know, in terms of prepared um, slides, we do have, yeah, there's, we do have, uh, from a previous public meeting, we have a lot of stuff <coughs> talking about staging, uh, traffic detours, all that stuff, but we didn't think it'd be of interest so much here, so we have it kind of in the back of the deck if needed, but. Um, Maybe of interest, but not within our purview. Yeah, sure, yeah. okay, all right, so. Um, I don't know, is there anything that kind of jumps out as something I might have forgotten to mention? Um, uh, I would ask a couple of things. Yeah, sure. This is a good time. Um, so just for the record, nice seeing you all again. My name is Robert Contario, over from ASDOT. Thanks for having us. So just to uh, highlight a couple of quick things that Steve went over is uh, the project team working on this now for a number of months and even the last couple of years. Uh, just an amazing amount of improvements overall from from where we started to where we came to. Just trimming back again and again and again the, the work and the width on Route 5. Uh, I think a major commitment uh, by the design team and also by financially with using that MSE wall to pull back instead of having a two to one slope going way out from the Route 5, pulling that way back in. Greatly reduced impacts resource areas, left us a lot of great space to work for stormwater improvements. Um, the BBW impacts we cut, chiseled down to under 200 square feet for projects this size is great. Temporary impacts are still, are high in BBW, but the restoration process that it will go through, a lot of the, the wetlands aren't really even recognized, kind of, if you will, as wetland areas. Now will be formally recognized, uh, restored back, I think much better conditions than they are removing those invasive species. I'm really excited about it. I think we made a lot of great improvements. Uh, we just went at it again and again and again, just pulled down through. Uh, really a great uh, holistic process. I was excited that we were able to take the whole project and put it through the analytic process, which really, uh, you know, put us to the test. And so thanks for listening. And you know, we're here. 
long as you want to discuss questions and build the project. Thanks, sir. Sure. One thing I should mention on this basin is the, uh, or this pond is uh, Tara Mitchell was interested in preserving some of the larger oak trees, so we're getting a survey showing where the oak trees are, and if we have to carve out, you know, or tweak the outline to save some of those oak trees, then, then we will. Other questions? Yes, yes. Other yes. questions, sir. Um, how, how about uh, runoff control during construction? Well, there will be a stormwater uh, pollution prevention plan developed, and it'll have all the standard BMPs, uh, sill fence. We have we have sill fence shown on the construction drawings uh, for the whole project, and uh, they'll have to follow all the DOTs. You know, DOT have an on-site inspector. Basically, standard DOT BMPs. Can you talk a little bit about how the uh, existing and replacement levels will be improved through this project? Now they're they're, they're sort of just left over in a core release and, and ignored. Um, I I think yeah. this is a great location for them. So just curious how that would be addressed. Sure. The that is going to have the permanent impacts is this wetland to the So basically, uh, there's going to be, when this is restored, it'll be restored to pretty much what it is. We'll use native seed mix, wetland seed mix, to restore the temporary impacts. And then the permanent uh, impacts will just be now this uh, MSE wall. So basically, it'll be a one-to-one -one slope. Um, and so there won't be any improvements to uh, wetland 2B, basically. We're, gonna try, we're just minimizing the impacts and then restoring it more or less what it is. Uh, you know, because it'll have a native seed mix, uh, in theory, the the plants should be a better, you know, better mix, more more of a wetland mix than is there right now. But um, it won't appear any different. We, we're not uh, proposing to change the type of wetland or create a shrub wetland or anything like that. Mowing frequency going to stay the same? Yes. Yeah. Uh, this wetland is. This is the same, this is wetland one. Uh, you can see the pure columns and you can see it's wet. <laughs> and uh, there's basically, this is looking south. So it, it, south of the bridges, it turns sort of shrubby. Um, and underneath the bridges themselves, it's pretty much herbaceous. We're gonna be um, uh, putting down boards to, you know, during construction to support construction uh, of the bridges. And then we'll be restoring it by um, uh, scarifying it, uh, you know, tilling it, uh, and adding wetland seed mix to it. And uh, uh, so it'll have an improved mix of seed, and we'll be eliminating things like the uh, bittersweet and the uh, blue strife. Uh, there's quite a few invasive species there now. There's some garbage sort of strewn around there at the moment. So um, it'll be not as it, that is a degraded wetland as it is right now. But um, still, it'll be maintained. I mean, it won't ever develop into a forested wetland because it's under the bridges and uh, it can't be, uh, you know, we, need to, we do need access in the future. So um, it'll be improved, but uh, you know, not, it'll, it'll be improved by removing the invasives and removing the trash and uh, yeah, this is the, the, you can see the, you know, the basic, the look of it right now. And, uh, you know, eventually, it, you know, it may return to that years from now as the invasives, you know, well, 
trying to encroach, but uh, uh, upon completion, it should have much, much lower bases. And uh, whatever maintenance program we apply will be you know, help to keep the maintenance bases out. In periods of uh, heavy rainfall, that area um, grows pretty fragrant uh, in, in a way that seems. Oh. Um, like there's sewage or something? Like oh. sewage, right. Okay. Uh, and I was wondering if there's any analysis about where that might be coming from. I wasn't aware of that, so I will. Uh, I I, I, I wasn't aware of that, so I can share his it again. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. If on the part just pretty much under the uh, overpass, uh, it kind of has a sulfury smell. Yeah. yeah. Well, there is there. Wastewater treatment plant nearby, but I don't think. Yeah, there's, there, a, there's a look up. Okay. Uh, so, unless it's wafting over there, but that could, you, could, could be, but it's been consistent enough that the, the, the couldn't seem, well, I can't say what direction the wind is blowing yeah. at a particular time, but yeah, I have noticed it over the years. It would be also nice to get rid of the junkyard. What's that? It would be also nice to get rid of the junkyard. Which junkyard? Uh, Further down. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, can I just add? Sure. Thank you. Um, so now, you know, this process and going through the MEPA process and another part which I really uh, like as far as environmental protection, which I uh, really enjoy that part of it, is that with this project now going through the NOI process, this is basically declaring these weapons as jurisdictional, mm -hmm. right? So now going forward, where maybe in the past, bridge exemption, bridge exemption, this puts it in perpetuity. So this is now under uh, Conservation Commission's and Weapon Protection Act and DEP's jurisdiction. So all these weapons here, the weapons across the street, the restoration of that, that's in, per in perpetuity. So that is a major, uh, bonus plus, if you will, by going through this process. And I uh, want to make, kind of in a way, stating the obvious, but also want to bring that out in this discussion where those weapons are, are greatly benefit from, especially from afterwards as the project's winding down and uh, compost, soils, soils are brought in, refreshed with mm -hmm. uh, some seed mix, those invasives are brought out of there. This is really going to enhance those. And those are now jurisdictional ones. So that's, that's Thank key. Beyond so just the approach to permitting, how did Mass DOT consider this project differently than it would have maybe 20 or 30 years ago? Because it, there are certainly more impacts that you would have allowed to do under the Weapons Protection Act, but that's been significantly reduced from the, even the initial design. Yeah, I, I think, <coughs> you know, I mean, it, 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 what was the reason we cut back the impacts to this extent? Yeah, and just maybe talk a little bit about how you're looking at things from an agency perspective a little bit differently than what's been done in the past. Sure. Uh, you probably have the longer view, but I know just uh, sure. I know just the change in design from the first iteration. Uh, we um, we found we did have I don't have the numbers in front of me, but we did have quite a bit larger wetland impacts, and we knew we'd have to create compensation and so we really tried to minimize that and then the floodplain storage area was even a, a higher challenge because of the one one foot increment uh, requirement so that's what steered us in the direction of the MSE wall which I guess maybe your, in years past might not have been you know considered um, the MSE wall is being used on another mass stop project in Northampton one exit up uh, around the roundabout Yeah, I mean, we, we, we would have liked to entirely avoid the, uh, the wildland impact and just, uh, but we just didn't, didn't see a feasible way to do that. So, uh, I but, yeah. add a little bit too, Mr. Chair. Uh, and too, with this, it's been, for me, to be able to go right from really very, very, very 
you know, infancy of the project to start incorporating environmental uh, right in every step along the way. Uh, just for an example, uh, to go over the uh, work with natural heritage. I mean, uh, we completed that such a long time ago, not in a way of, you know, this is a checkbox that we have to check, but let's engage early in the process. We didn't even have 25%, you know, going to 75% plans yet at that point. And we took it, uh, even though the polygon for, uh, for the habitat was in this one wetland area, we reviewed the entire, except for up on the bridges, the entire footprint of the project and then some. We had a team of uh, biologists, I was lucky enough to be included in that. We had plant biologists, we had uh, Carol Frost out the entire day looking for this um, plant. You know, uh, and we knew that, that the habitat, you know, was it there? Yeah, potentially it was there. So we looked at the whole area, and to me, that's just a good example to show what we did for all the different resource areas of this project. Right from, right from uh, infancy of the project, incorporating it, avoiding it, minimizing. Um, so uh, I, I think that really is another way of uh, where DOT has really been taking this uh, wholeheartedly and not just at a certain point start, starting to look at the impacts and starting to look at the permitting. We're looking at you know uh, those conversations and opening up those discussions right from the get-go. Um, it's, it's, for me, uh, doing environmental all my life, this has really been exciting um, and challenging at the same time. Uh, so it's been great. Any other questions or anything else from the commission? Yeah. Uh, those uh, DEP comments about um, soil types and so forth. And testing yes. is going to be done in February, as I recall. Uh, uh, yes. Is that, yes. Is that um, um, because this is an area where I know anything technically else maybe uh, do our test bits uh, in February uh, uh, reliably revealing of, of all the information we need and uh, in frozen ground? Like that? We have a geotech uh, sub consultant uh, and they're working with us on that. I've GZA will be working on it too. <coughs> and it's, we'll leave it is because it'll be the inherent qualities of the soil. And you get the soil type. Yeah. 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 So you get the type yeah. and classification. Of it. Yeah. yeah. So, but, it, but as, as you know, we are getting uh, soil test pits in both of the uh, bioretention pond areas. Because yeah. uh, right. we, we made an, uh, we made a conservative assumption based on the soil maps, but uh, Mark Stinson uh, and DOT internal reviewers also noted uh, that because this area in particular is very uh, been manipulated a lot by the construction over the years it could be one thing here and very close by it could be something else so it was particularly important in this case okay so that's one piece of information we'll be looking for in the future closely anything else we're going to be meeting it's not already part of the application. Uh, will, will the wetland flags in critical locations be added? So I can field check it. Yeah. Do you, would you rather have those added now or just before construction or? Uh, we could probably we could probably work in a way to condition that if necessary. Given the elevation, like yeah. you know, there's been a whole lot of change, at least yeah. in the areas that are being directly disturbed. But it, um, you do have to verify. So reflagging it might be a, a condition of the uh, order of conditions. Yeah. Okay. Just again, Mr. Chair, I'd like to add sure. just for uh, informational purposes. Uh, the entire project area was delineated twice by two different consultants, just due to you know, different complexities to make sure we were giving a, a, a fair, very thorough look at all the different wetland types that are there. Uh, you may notice some of the areas are isolated wetlands. Those isolated wetlands are within uh, areas created by the original installation of I-91. Mm -hmm. So were they originally when I-91 was put in? Probably not, but due to 
you know, soil saturation and just the amount of uh, runoff that comes off impervious surfaces, those have now been created as wetlands. So we gave them equal, uh, you know, jurisdictional value when it came to the Wetlands Protection Act. So I think we were very conservative on the side of giving those isolated bordering uh, wetlands uh, jurisdiction. As you were looking at those, is there any uh, reptiles, uh, uh, other animal uh, uh, species that are resident in these wetlands, or are you mostly concerned with uh, foliage? Yeah, I mean, there's um, <coughs> definitely animal tracks that go through there. Uh, nothing uh, that I saw, either uh, live or mortality of amphibians, reptiles. Mm -hmm. Bird, bird species for sure. Um, deer prints, pretty much everywhere, some smaller mammals. Um, but as we look at the, these isolated areas, the, the basically the low spot areas where the stormwater is running off or the water shedding off Route 5 or coming down off of stormwater outfalls, uh, there's nothing I, I saw of any indication of uh, over the past few years looking at the area of any type of use by. Maybe some some springtime species or some, something yeah, like that. Not that it's out of it. Not that it couldn't happen. What time of year was Tara out there? We were there. When did we complete that? Was it, was it July? It was very specific. The rare species. Yeah, it was yeah, July yeah, or yeah, August. Yeah. It was very specific for uh, the green dragon. I think it was, was July. Eat, you know, salamanders and well, frogs. Yeah. So I've been out there every season. Uh, couple of staff members I go out with who have reviewed the project. Uh, we've been out there every season the past couple of years. Uh, something I regularly do anyway, just as uh, my background being in biology, uh, looking at these different areas. Uh, no indication of any type of big masses, use salamanders, things like that. And I've seen salamanders, uh, you know, they can be found along I-91 at several locations up and down mm -hmm. in the River Valley. Uh, nothing here that I've noted, again, over the past couple of years. That's, again, one of the benefits uh, of working on a project like this is that it's not just a one-time look, looking at it in the spring or looking at summer, then season after season after season for a couple of years. So uh, it's, I could relatively say with pretty, pretty good confidence that So anything else we can add that we want to notify? Because we're going to continue this until we get uh, the your further along, until we can see the tested data and so forth. So, are there any other specific things that we've done? Uh, when do you anticipate getting the water quality certification? Uh, well, we're submitting it, I guess, either today or tomorrow. Um, and you just have to connect with uh, individual weeks to, to several weeks, the, um, the number of people at DEP, uh, including the reviewer for DEP, uh, that we normally work with has reviewed the site, the Western Regional Office, if, if they're uh, reviewing the water quality cert, which I believe they are, I'm not sure how, how many or any of those reviewers on the wetlands section of Springfield Office of DEP has seen the site. You know, there's a number of us will be prepared for uh, any questions or if they need more information out in the field and things like that. Uh, so it's, I'd be able to give you a little bit more accurate turnaround time if it was our usual reviewers from Lake Lake Office of DP, but I believe that um, it is the Springfield Office reviewing it. Yeah, I talked to um, Dr. Cordero, or no, I'm sorry, yeah, David Goldstein, and he, I think he may be submitting it to the Lakeville office. Oh, yes. and, uh, yeah, just yesterday. So maybe my, yeah, my initial assumption was it would be the Springfield office, but uh, that may not be the case. Maybe it's both offices on it. Yeah. So there's maybe some 
discrepancy on that, but we can clarify. And, and, uh, yeah, because Mark Stinson was asking the same thing. And uh, we could let Sarah know who's sure. going to be reviewing it, yep. just for informational purposes. Yep. If we could continue to a date certain and then roll it on into the future if you're not ready. So uh, from, be good if we had some idea, but like we went to, so when are you done enough that we will not have everything before us? Do, does the water quality certificate need to be approved before um, the order of conditions is issued? Or it's, it's not a strict statutory requirement, but it's always requested by the DEP so that we can incorporate any required plan changes or okay. conditions. Yeah. And we're very open to any um, conditions that give the, the commission a feeling that they can adapt. Uh, conditions to the water quality, sir. Any, any comments that may arise from NEPA through the EAF process, we're, we're open to that. Uh, if you feel the Commission has any conditions that they want to include in that. Uh, moving forward during construction, uh, final design phases, mm -hmm. uh, and of course in, in perpetuity. So we're open to anything. Can you write another your timeline? Final design in May? Where do we, where, where does uh, the NOI fit in that timeline? Do you need to uh, have, uh, have our box checked before that? Um, yeah, I need to circle back and no, see. No, no, no. We, we need to have everything, all the permits, everything signed in place before we ever advertise the project. Uh, but it wouldn't hold up a design submission. The design submissions are just next advancements of the details of the plans. Um, as far as the concept of the plans, the impact areas, none, none of that is, a, is going to be affected from going forward unless there's some specific requirement from DDP. Um, but the design is, is, is set, curb lines, widths, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Nothing is changing. And so you've been out uh, to, uh, to look at this, but not in light of this specific project? Uh, I went out in the absence of a full set of plans. I moved into September, I think. Uh, we walked around the site, yeah, yeah. Totally. talked about some, um, some potential changes that I think were all incorporated. Uh, the wetland replication area was initially proposed in an area that <coughs> made as much sense for the yeah, yeah, we had to look at it kind of in isolation over on, on the wetland, uh, in the infield area, and we just put it back off on its own. So we moved into this location here. So what's, uh, at least February, because that's when the textbook data is going to be completed. So. Uh, March, what, what's realistic on your end? We can schedule it pretty flexibly. Uh, I think, yeah, late February or March. March. We get the, uh, okay, what's the first uh, Thursday, uh, the first meeting in March? Right, so the uh, 12th? The 12th is the 26th. Yeah. Sounds, sounds good. 12th? Yeah, because I think once, you know, once we get the data, um, what you're going to be doing is we've done all the calculations and everything to date based on, um, you know, the assumed soil classifications yeah. Yeah. from the available information, uh, soil maps. So it's just a matter of getting the new sort of classifications and verifying the calculations. They're already done. You know, to make sure that the numbers um, don't change when we, when we use the actual values based on the soil. So it's not, I, again, the process of what's getting the data isn't a long process. Right? It's you know, you're back into the, the calculation we already done and verify that the assumption numbers uh, versus the real numbers 
come at the soil really don't change it, and, and not that we expect because they've been fairly conservative in the design all along, you know, you know just to be cognizant of that. Because uh, we don't want any surprises and changes to go before mm -hmm. either. We're much, much safer being conservative early. And then we'll have the survey for where these large oak trees are also, so we can make any tweaks uh, to those. And if there's any other things that the, the updated survey shows, we can give those tweaks you know, before presenting it finally. So want to say March 12th? And the continuation date? Sarah, do we have anything else on the agenda? Uh, the only thing we have at this point is the duty court item that has been continued several times. I don't know how realistic was for them to continue to 5.30. So we can do this when it's at 6 and there's a not being something before. Okay. So, so I want to make a motion to continue this case to March 12th at 6 o'clock. So moved. And a second? Seconded. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> and Sarah, do we have any permits to review? Not, no. Nothing else to me at all. Well, uh, <laughs>